So uh, my name is uh, Stefano Maffulli, and I'm the community manager work at the OpenStack Foundation. Um, and today we're going to talk about a little bit um, about the tensions inside the community and try to um, have a debate, um, a lively one. So we're going to be welcoming questions also from the audience. Two gentlemen have agreed to represent uh, two sides of the community, if you want. Um, so why don't you guys introduce yourself with better words than I could be using. I'm Randy Bias, the CEO and co-founder of Cloud Scaling. Um, we're well known and regarded for doing a lot of uh, the early production OpenStack deployments for Korea Telecom, Internap, and AT&T. Um, and uh, before this, I have a long history in the cloud. I worked at a company called GoGrid, which was the second public cloud provider in the United States. And I built a startup before that that was a right scale competitor that was a, essentially a cloud application management dashboard. And I prototyped that on Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud in uh, December of 2006 while it was in private beta before most people knew what cloud was and before the terms had been uh, coined. And I've been blogging and talking about cloud at both the infrastructure and application layers ever since. All right, hard to, hard to match that. Uh, Scott Sanchez, director at Rackspace, I do a lot of evangelism. Um, joined Rackspace about two and a half years ago to help build out the OpenStack ecosystem and working with um, Mark Collier and the team that has moved on to the foundation and Jim Curry and, and those folks to help a lot of folks just understand the value of OpenStack and what it can do for uh, the users once we all work together to build something and, and bring it together. So um, uh, we kind of proposed this talk. We submitted similar talks that got voted on uh, reasonably equally and um, figured out how to combine them and just say, hey, let's, let's represent. You know, Randy's kind of uh, grew up on the, on the infrastructure side, very heavy view of, of how all that should come together. And I've been more focused on the user side, and that's hopefully what we are, are going to talk about today. So a false dichotomy, but it's okay. It, it is. I mean, I, I spend as much time on the infrastructure as you spend on the users, but That's right. it, it's, <laughs> it's uh, definitely we had to pick a side here. So that those are the sides we picked today. So let's let's get started then, since you already mentioned it. Um, I, you know, OpenStack as a project has been growing very fast, very rapidly. It started with developers, started with uh, solving solving problems, uh, and it's been. Uh, historically probably driven by developers meeting at the summit. The initial summits, if you think about it, were uh, just the design summit, which is now a very small session, a set of sessions uh, down do in the corridor. And the, the user side of the uh, summit itself has become much larger. So um, how, do you, how do you guys see this, this uh, uh, tension between users on one end that demand features and the infrastructure or the developers um, driven development of OpenStack? Is there, what, what's your thought? What are your thoughts? So um, I, I got asked uh, at the end of my AWS repatriation talk on Tuesday, I got asked, uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is to OpenStack? <laughs> and I had to actually sit back for about 30 seconds and think <laughs> about it. And um, you know, some of this stuff's been percolating for a while, and, the, and the, the sort of epiphany I had right at that moment and that I explained to the crowd was that there's sort of a disconnect between the wishes and desires and intentions of not two, but three different constituencies. You have the end users of the cloud, and from now on, for the rest of this debate, I'm going to refer to end users as people who consume the APIs of a cloud, the publicly facing APIs to deploy applications. You've got the developer around OpenStack, and then you've got the operators, the people who build, deploy, and actually run a uh, production system of OpenStack. And their desires are very disconnected. Uh, the end users all want standardization and interoperability. They want a common platform. They want OpenStack to be ubiquitous so that they can build apps and have, it, have them run on any OpenStack cloud. Uh, the operators all want to be able to get in under the hood of their car and hot rod it. This guy over here says, we're a VMware shop, we've got to have VMware. That guy says, I need EMC. That guy says, I'm doing SDN. That guy says, I'm, I need VLANs, and so on and so on. Every single one of those guys kind of wants to have it their way on the cloud operator side. In the middle, you've got the developers who have mostly to date been taking input from the cloud operators and to some degree ignoring the end users of, the open, of these OpenStack systems, the deployed systems, and the developers 
you know, with no uh, offense meant, largely are trying to scratch an itch. They're here because they can do innovation and they can build something new and they're very excited and, you know, that passion is great for the community, but uh, a lot of the times uh, disconnects show up in terms of what the developers deliver as it doesn't necessarily feed especially the end users and also quite often the cloud operators' actual desires. I definitely feel the disconnect and have for years between the the developers that are here and designing what should go into the next release and what I hear when I go out and I talk to uh, SMBs or startups or enterprises about what they want to do with it, uh, I think there, there really is a, a disconnect between the developer group and the consumer uh, group of users. But the, the providers, I, I also think, are and working for a provider, you, you came out of that space as well. I, I think that <clears throat> there's, there's often a disconnect there between where a provider thinks they want to add value or be differentiated and where the end user, the consumer user, actually wants to see that value. So you mentioned, I want to pick a particular kind of storage or I want to do something different at the infrastructure level. So you, the developers that are here that are building OpenStack uh, feed on that because that's, that's the cool stuff that's happening. But the end users don't necessarily get the value out of that or they may not be ready to consume the value out of that for two years. And there's a lot of things that could have been happening in the meantime to make their lives easier or, or make the outcome for them better. So what, what you're saying is that, what I hear you saying is that you ha we have this tension and um, maybe the project, since it started without an architect in mind, without having uh, the one person that has the vision for the project and where the innovation will drive, um, is how is that shaping the innovation inside OpenStack? How is that? Be because I'm, you know, I'm going back to uh, some, 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 wasn't it Steve Jobs that said, users don't know what they want, you have to tell them, you have to give them the innovation because if you wait for them to innovate, they will never do it. Um, maybe an offensive way of, uh, of describing the users of Apple products, but in, um, what, what, what do you think? I mean, we don't have that Steve Jobs inside OpenStack. Is that uh, a limitation or um, how do you think the innovation will be coming from OpenStack? Uh, I mean, that's a really hard question to answer. I mean, I, we're a different community than the other open source communities that came before. We're charting our own course in many ways, and I, I don't think it's fair to compare it to sort of communities that have had benevolent dictators. Um, on the other hand, you know, you definitely see uh, some shortcomings in the technical decisions quite frequently uh, in OpenStack. For example, the default networking model is completely and utterly broken in every way possible that you could, po that you could imagine for a production system, and it hasn't been fixed in you know, years. Um, and if you probably got you know, 10 different developers around the table to talk about it, they'd give you 10 different answers about how to fix it, and none of them have a network background. <laughs> right? And so that's a little bit of a problem. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I do like this democratic process. I do like the fact that um, we come to conclusions by going through a struggle of ideas where the best ideas rise to the top. I mean, you know, I put a lot of effort into building the cloud scaling team to have a certain amount of diversity of opinion, and I, I got a lot of opinions back home. And, um, you know, the whole reason for that was to build a team where uh, people could find each other's blind spots. Because quite frankly, in the early days, when we built off of my single opinion as the benevolent dictator, I made a lot of bad calls in terms of the technology. I made some good ones, I made some bad ones, but what I didn't have was a good track record. And no individual, I think, can have a good track record, um, but a group of individuals acting as a team can actually work together to have a very good track record in tactical and strategic decision making from a technical architecture point of view. But you actually have to construct it that way. We don't really have an architecture team uh, to replace that in OpenStack, right? Amazon Web Services has an architecture team. I don't know if people knew that. Um, you know, I have an architecture team, you know, so why, why doesn't the OpenStack community have an architecture team uh, to supplement the technical committee that can really provide input, right? Because at Amazon Web Services, how it works is that if you want to do something new or different that's going to change the architecture, you have to take your idea up to Werner Vogels and um, James, um, I forget what his name is, uh, Morova or Madrova, huh? James Hamilton. James Hamilton, thank you. And there's several others there, and then you basically have to prove that your idea is valid, and they beat up on you, and you have to keep coming back until you know something comes through. And so that's, I, I, it'd be nice if we had that. 
It's a different kind of meritocracy. It's, it's, a, it's a meritocracy with a little bit of a um, uh, wisdom and oversight added. Right. So I, I think that the way that we, as a community, do code review as things get written and committed and checked, um, when we look at the user committee and some of the recent efforts spun up around that, talk about an architecture um, overlord group that, that keeps track of things. I think that that group shouldn't necessarily be technical architects as much as it should be users, right? And so when you think about a feature, you think about a decision or a direction that fundamentally um, alters the path that we're on, I think it's the users that should have to kind of check the box and say, yes, and that user group isn't just the end consumers, it's also the providers and the operators and, and other things, but I think a lot of the decisions that get made here at the summits and, and in between are, are driven by kind of the new hotness or you know, what, what the, um, the, the vendor that they're representing is, is, is in the market selling. And, and that doesn't always necessarily bring the best outcome for the end users. Having said that, we've made a lot of great decisions and the number of users that are here consuming the platform is evidence that um, for the most part we're doing the right thing. But like you said, there's been decisions made along the way or new projects spun up or other things that, you know, <laughs> Users may look at and, and not end feel great about. End users can't make architecture decisions. End users are for providing requirements into the system. And so as those business requirements are interpreted, you figure out how to build an architecture that serves those business requirements. I, it's like going into a doctor's office and telling them, I've got the, you know, I've got the plague, give me penicillin, right? I mean, you can't go in and do the diagnosis yourself because you're not the expert. What, what you can go in is you can go in, you can explain your problem, mm -hmm. and you can actually help the doctor understand what you're trying to accomplish, and then they can actually solve it for you. And, and I think that's finally happening, right? We've got a, a large enough mass of users, whether it's service providers or uh, the bigger group, which are the people building applications on top of OpenStack, that a lot of that's happening back through the folks that are now representing, right? If we look up through Diablo, Essex, there just weren't really a lot of users to have those conversations with, but there are now. And you know, I, I would guess that most of you have had actual conversations with actual customers about what they they'd like to see an OpenStack, how they wished it worked. Well, let's, let's, right? And so I'm not saying that they should come in and dictate the technical architecture. Let, let's stop using they the word users. The I, I'd, like, I'd like you to use either consumers. operators or end users because right now, if you look at the user committee, it is, there are three people on it and they represent cloud operators. Correct. Right? Ryan Lane from Wikimedia, Tim Bell from CERN, and uh, JC from eBay. And all three of them are op bu built and operate their, their cloud. They are not the end users. So okay. that voice that you're talking about, I totally agree. I think we're in alignment it that it needs to get in there. Bigger, right? But it's not, it's not there. It's today. not there today. The user yeah. committee does not have end users of OpenStack in there, you know, basically giving that voice. And I completely agree that we need their requirements in the system. And I think that it would shake loose a lot of this crazy spaceship building that you sometimes see in, open, in, in the OpenStack community, right? Like, you know, does it make sense to go build X, Y, and Z if, you know, the actual end users who are u consuming OpenStack clouds just don't care and aren't consuming that? Yeah, I completely agree. I think that the, the, the method that that occurs in can't be in a vacuum user group that, you know, like the, the stats and the, and the end data that's- End operators. End user group, right? The, the operators to me, uh, are almost the least important group. Yes, right? agreed. The operators should have the user committees in their own companies that drive what they want to totally say, agree. right? But the, the mass group of people that are over time gonna make OpenStack more successful is not the operators, it's the people consuming the things that all of that is, is providing, right? Yeah. It gets, um, it, we, we got to that point finally, we got to the point where we finally facing developers that are using the OpenStack clouds, OpenStack powered clouds. And when we get to that point, we start to um, getting a little bit uh, probably closer to, to um, other set of problems. And Randy had um, a, a, post, a blog post during the summer about, about this, about talking to these, these developers. And, Maybe you want to you want to discuss about a uh, little bit about what what sort of uh, what are the differences, uh, the new things, the new challenges that you end up uh, facing when you go beyond OpenStack itself as the software when it starts running on top of real infrastructure and when you start make uh, m m 
uh, bending OpenStack with uh, uh, opinions, giving opinions to OpenStack to an OpenStack-powered cloud. Uh, what is that entails for developers? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it's funny because you know I I started off in cloud actually at the application layer, building this tool that would deploy applications on EC2. So um, even though I am mostly historically an infrastructure guy, I have a lot of hands-on experience actually using these public and private clouds as a as a developer and user, writing Chef code, writing Ruby, all that stuff. Uh, you know, writing low-level stuff to call the EC2 API, XML parsing, like pretty, pretty in the weeds stuff. And um, you know, the thing that became really apparent to me while I was at GoGrid was that the infrastructure is, even though it's sexy right now, is pretty much totally irrelevant from a business point of view. There's no inherent value in infrastructure. Nobody gives a shit when it comes to the business. It does not make, if you have an EMC VMAX, Right, deployed, and your part, your competitor does. Like neither of you has competitive advantage over each other. All of the real business value is up the stack from the infrastructure and the platform and the applications. That's where the true business value is. But instead of sort of paying attention to that and saying, okay, let's standardize on what the infrastructure looks like. Let's only have a few flavors. Like there's only a few flavors of electricity or a few flavors of Linux distributions. What we have is we have a bunch of snowflakes. Every OpenStack deployment is its own snowflake. It's completely unique. Everybody, when they want to play with OpenStack, wants to build a yet another snowflake because they feel that they've got some different requirement so that they need to build their infrastructure in some slightly different way, which doesn't serve the purpose of allowing the end users to be successful and it, con it confuses things in the development community because we're an inclusive community and the development community wants to serve everybody's request. They want to serve the cloud operators and the end users. They want to you know, respond to the fact that this guy over here wants support for some strange esoteric storage system that nobody but him is going to use. And if you look at the user survey results, you'll see there's a long tail of all kinds of different technologies that people want to use with OpenStack and every one of those actually incurs some technical debt. And I know it's going to be difficult to like, get everybody to rally around the table around a few flavors of OpenStack that are essentially interoperable and compatible, but it seems hard to realize the value of the platform and application pieces that we want to run OpenStack unless we can actually do that. It's one of the things that makes me question why there seems to be a lot of friction as a community when we try and do things that are more up the stack to try and, and serve those end users better. You know, when you talk about the providers, um, they're trying to serve those same users, but they're, they're doing it uh, you know, really with, with some blinders on in terms of, like you said, thinking this storage will be better than the storage or, or whatever it might be. And the, the, that, that friction that I continuously feel up the stack, wherever it is, is frustrating because as a community, those are the people that matter. Right? The folks that are building clouds with OpenStack we're trying to serve those users. The, the people that are here learning how to build applications for OpenStack, you are those users. And, and a lot of the, the discussions that are, that are had about, you know, should it be this format or this format, um, I, I feel like there's this divide between how much should we decide for them and push to them and say, this is just the way it's gonna be. Should it be three flavors or 30 flavors? Should it be one kind of storage or 50? You know, should we push that to them or should we let them pull and tell us I actually don't think enough of the people building applications on OpenStack or any cloud for that matter, there's not enough people that actually know what the heck they're doing yet. And I do think that the smart people in this room need to tell them more uh, as opposed to give them more choice. Well, I feel like it's a dialogue. I think that's part of what you're saying is that we need uh, that virtuous feedback loop where we get the requirements and that what, what's the business, don't tell me how you're sick, tell me what the business right. problem is that you're trying to solve so that we can talk about that, right? I mean, it's that whole challenge that Henry Ford had around talking to people and they said, a car, what's that? You know, I, 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 you know, how do I feed the car grass every 20 miles or whatever, right? I mean, you know, I want a faster horse, make me a faster horse, except a faster horse is uh, a longer process. Right. And you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Exactly. Right. So, you know, they're, they're, we're at this kind of like, you know, tipping point where we're starting to figure out how to build these private clouds and deploy applications on them that are highly scalable and elastic. And um, we need to get that, that virtuous feedback loop in there, uh, not just in OpenStack, but even the product companies uh, that are building stuff on top of it as well. Yeah, they're, they're, 
the folks that were here exhibiting. And I was amazed when I walked in this morning that the entire expo hall is completely gone overnight. Um, but the, the folks that are that are here, I mean, we all have conversations with each other and with our customers every day. And you know, we've all got different things that we want to make available in OpenStack for for whatever reason. But I think you take a step back and you look at how is a user actually going to consume this over this? Is there value in doing this over this? Should we consolidate the way that they look to the users and abstract that complexity? Or do we expose that complexity? Is there value to the end users in, in, in those cases? And I think in a lot of cases, the answer is no. Um, but the users don't necessarily yet know what they're supposed to ask for. Right, to, to go back <laughs> to the original question, do, do they know? Um, no, one, one of the things that um, was emerging from your conversation was that um, it seems that OpenStack is one project, one set of code, uh, but still we end up getting a lot of different snowflakes type of different implementation. So what, what do you think is, um, the, if, if the code is the same and we should have all the same clouds with the same behaviors, what is going to be the differentiating business factor? Why am I going to be able, as a, as a company investing in OpenStack, how am I going to say um, I'm going to be better at this than another if everybody behaves the same? Um, so there's, there's kind of two pieces there, right? So if you run the same software, you don't necessarily have the same cloud. I mean, uh, people need to stop thinking about OpenStack as being like downloading MySQL and creating a database, create database foo, semicolon, boom, your database is up. It's not like that. It's like downloading the Linux kernel and rolling your own Linux distribution. That's what it's like. Um, and so, you know, all the choices you make once you download it is what turns it into a snowflake, right? Uh, the simple example I gave on Tuesday during my talk is IP auto assignment. I have two OpenStack clouds. And on one, I've got floating IP auto assignment. On the other, I don't. Configuration option, same code, same release, completely different behavior, right? So that's, that's, a, that's a problem. That's why I keep ranting on the fact that we need these flavors, because then you can compare it, right? Is this an AWS compatible cloud, a Rackspace compatible cloud, a vCloud compatible cloud? What is it? What kind of OpenStack cloud is it? Um, and then the second part of the question was, Remind how me. to differentiate business. How oh, how to differentiate. So like hosting providers have been very successful, like Rackspace, pre-cloud, uh, without a lot of differentiation. And the reason is, is that you know, at, asking to differentiate infrastructure is like asking to differentiate water and electricity, right? It's like, oh, am I going to get water from this guy who's distilled it and has colored it red, or am I going to get water from this guy? No, you're just going to want to turn on the damn faucet and the water comes out. That's all you want because what you're actually trying to do is the application of that water, of that utility, right? You just want to boil something or cook something, or if it's electricity, you want to power something. You, know, you don't really care about that lowest level commodity. So the service providers need to be looking at ways to actually help customers solve problems where the business value is at the platform and application layers because that's fundamentally where there's true value. Whether I use an EMC and you use a NetApp or Ceph or Gluster or something else, there, that's, there's no inherent value in that infrastructure technology to a business. Yeah, to use the, the water analogy, we want to make it easy to get the water when you need it and make it hot or cold when you need it and give you a, a comfortable glass to, to drink it in. And it, it, like, it, that's where the differentiation should be coming from. But you're right, a lot of people are um, looking to, to re-engineer how the pipes look behind your sink that no one will ever see. Exactly. Right? Hey, this water comes out um, you know, with, with more air in it. I, I really don't care about that. Right? It's evaporated before it gets to, to my lips. How, how, how does it taste when I drink it? And, and how easy is it to use, I think, or where the differentiation needs to come from. The whole experience of using it and how, how, it, how it benefits me is where the differentiation should come from. But as, as a global community, I think the, um, the folks that primarily are represented here, not all of us have made that journey yet. Um, maybe this is a good time to ask for questions. Brian. So I just wanted to make a clarification the user committee. Um, the three user committee members are all um, operators, but we also have large groups of users who also give us feedback that these are information. Sure. But past that, um, realistically, the reason that we focused on operators so far is because the feedback that we're actually getting from, from the community as a whole, the priorities at this point in time are so dire 
like actually running OpenStack and making it work, that it actually trumps any feedback that you're getting from the users. Like the, the biggest feedback that we get is that OpenStack is too hard to install and that it's too hard to upgrade. If you can't get past that point, you can't even get people to use OpenStack. And that means they're not gonna have users to begin with. Um, that said, um, we, our first iteration of getting feedback is mostly directed to operators, but our next priority is definitely getting it from end users. Great. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I have kind of a two-pronged response to some of the criticisms that you get here of, of engineering and the snowflakes. Um, I not, n <laughs> not criticism. <laughs> Observation. <laughs> Healthy debate and observation. Okay, so you say we should have a dialogue, right? The way you have a dialogue in the business world is you offer different products and you see which ones get bought, right? That's what's Great. going on with the snowflakes, right? So this, we're actually doing the dialogue in the way that makes a difference, right? I'm, I'm not sure you're really honoring the, the, um, the significance of what the uh, engineers and developers are trying to do, right? Everybody who puts in a new kind of file system or whatever, right, they're doing it because they think it actually delivers something that's valuable to end users, yeah. right? No, I, I value it, but so I was a Rubyist for a while. I haven't touched code for a couple of years now, but um, one of the things that frustrated me the most about the Ruby community is that at the drop of the hat, they would, re, they would reinvent a new piece of code, like, oh, I don't want to use a messaging system in Java, so let's just write one in Ruby because one doesn't exist. That's great, okay? One out of 20 times, some amazing thing came out of the Ruby community. The other 19 times, garbage came out, and you would go out there, and I, as a Rubyist, would try to use tools, and I would go, and I'd find out they were half dead. There's not really any community around it, no contributors, and it's not, the code isn't where it needs to be, and I don't have the time to go fix that. And it was very, very common. There was like almost like a graveyard of, projects that were subpar and were out there just kind of taking up space and mind share. And so I, I agree with you to a point, but I mean, I think the reality is, is that you know, we don't need to go out and invent everything in OpenStack. There's lots of other things out there. And, you know, why aren't we building our own database? Why do we use MySQL or MariahDB? Right? I mean, we should be thinking about that, right? I mean, not to, and I'm not trying to criticize to criticize, but you know, why did we build Keystone? I mean, there's so many identity management platforms out there that are extremely robust. Why isn't that a pluggable part of the system? And if we were going to build it, why doesn't it use OAuth 2.0 instead of some bastardization that looks like OAuth 2.0 but isn't OAuth 2.0 and isn't interoperable? I mean, those are design decisions that don't make sense. They actually hurt us and incur technical debt that is not good for the community, the developers, the operators, or the end users. Yeah. So my only uh, comment there would be the way that we've done things like um, SDN in, in Neutron, right, where things are, are pluggable and, and it gives the community a chance to experiment and the users a chance to pick what wins. I love that model, right? Storage is, is the same kind of thing, right? The, the way we started doing storage wasn't the best model. As a community, we figured out, hey, we should, we should have more drivers, we should move this thing out, let people experiment more, let's figure out you know, let's really innovate. And so OpenStack, for example, has become the place where SDN is coming together and where the, where the real innovation is being driven from. That's great. And the users are, are picking the winners. You can see in the, in the user survey what's starting to, to take shape. I love that. Uh, other decisions that we make as a community, whether it's about projects or related projects or ancillary projects or any of the other names that we give things, um, if you actually go back and, and look at what the users are asking for, it's not always those things. You, know, you brought up databases as an example, right? We're, we, we focus a lot of time and debate, healthy debate, uh, but debate about different things that aren't always what the end users, the consumers of these platforms would be looking for if we asked them. Okay, so uh, we have so many flavors and we're facing so many uh, snowflakes. Uh, as an operator or consumer of OpenStack, do you have any suggestions, you know, that we can make the best out of the current, you know, uh, nightmares? <laughs> a lot of folks that are, that are using uh, the Rackspace cloud do that through some kind of abstraction layer. And it's not necessarily the best solution, you could argue, for or against that model um, for a lot of companies. but. Uh, that comes from the fact that many people moving to OpenStack and, and OpenStack-powered public clouds are moving from Amazon or moving from 
VMware, some other platform that they've already coded against. And so to the Snowflake example, there's some things which make even an abstraction layer hard, like the way I give you a network or the way I authenticate you that doesn't necessarily just change your target endpoint and be done. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot of that. No matter how hard we as a community work, we're still going to have a bunch of that in the foreseeable future. And they're going to have environments that encompass technologies that are in OpenStack too, right? So I think you're going to continue to see some of that abstraction layer, uh, whether it's homegrown or, or some other project. And the important thing, is, you know, what I want people to take away is that we do need the flavors and not the snowflakes, right? I mean, that's great that people want to experiment. I want them to experiment. I'm not saying don't experiment, don't innovate. I'm just saying that for the stable production OpenStack deployments, you know, there needs to be some opinion in there and they need to be somewhat more standardized. And we need to use, use things like RefStack, which Josh and, and, and others are working on with, combined with Tempest tests to test those flavors. Like here's the AWS flavor, or what we call the Elastic Cloud flavor. Here's the Google Compute Engine flavor. Here's the vCloud flavor. Here's Rackspace Public Cloud, whatever they are. Um, and then you know, people can actually check to see whether they conform to compatibility and interoperability with those systems. And then, you know, kind of to your point, you know, hopefully, end users will choose what they like and then you know, the winners will rise to the top and we can all get where we want, which is you know, the final emergence of a few things that are dominant. This card drives on the left, this card drives on the right. So I, I, I'm not saying this to pimp my persona's talk after lunch at 1.30 in this room, um, but uh, I don't think the end user characterization is even useful. I, I, so you've made the distinction between operators and end users, I think that's good. Uh, but you've got the people who buy the cloud, you've got the people who deploy the cloud, and you've got the people who operate the cloud, and then you've sure. got the people who deploy applications on the cloud. And the people sure. who deploy applications on the cloud actually have very little input into the technology choices of what gets deployed. That's uh, the problem. So, I don't think I, so when you said users decide who wins, I don't think they do. I think the people who buy clouds decide who wins. I think that the people who are building the applications that are influencing or even more and more making the decisions about where those applications should live are ultimately the ones that are going to decide who wins and, and who loses. Right? So if you're a provider, you make a choice to build Snowflake A uh, version of OpenStack, and that's not what the people building and deploying applications ultimately think is the best for them, then they've made the wrong choice. Right? And so I agree with you that the end, end users of these things are not the ones influencing what necessarily is going into a data center, what's going into OpenStack, and what's coming out as the product, but they should be. And yeah. if they're not natively in our cycle, they are, at the end of the day, with their wallets. What's interesting is that the tension in our community actually mirrors one that exists in the enterprises, which when you look at them, they're sort of the centralized IT infrastructure teams, and then there's the application developers. I'm talking about the mainstream enterprises, not uh, tech companies, where it tends to be a little bit different. Um, and a lot of these application developers today, they go to centralized IT folks and you know, they're really trying to reduce their risk of their deployment. So they give this long laundry list of requests, including very specific hardware. I'm deploying this application, I need F5 load balancers because I'm using iRules, I need EMC storage and so on and so on. And the centralized IT team, you know, their whole uh, purpose in life is to cover their ass, CYA. That's how they have to make decisions because they're on the hook if anything fails. So in order to make sure that they can meet that request, they'll say, okay, you want this much stuff, I can give that to you for $10 million in 18 months. But that application developer, he needs to get going now because it's all about time to market for him. It's all about you know, trying to be successful and delivering new value to the business. So he says, well, maybe I'll go to Rackspace or maybe I'll go to Amazon and I'll just get up with a credit card and go right now. And he gets that much or she gets that much of their actual requirements. That laundry list becomes this. And they fit their application to that system. Now, yes, they had to conform to the infrastructure, but on the other hand, they got the value of getting to go immediately, paying by the drink, and so on. And I think that that's something that um, we have to think about. If we want to help enterprise centralized IT teams, the operators, be successful at deploying OpenStack clouds, the value of the OpenStack cloud has to be similar to the value of an Amazon or Rackspace or one of the other major public cloud providers because that's the only way for them to actually fix that sort of dysfunction. Yeah, the, the biggest way the end users will get value out of cloud, not just OpenStack, is to build for it, not try to build it for whatever broken application development models they have now. I just add that um, I think as, as the project started, we were serving our own needs. 
and that's Sorry. why a lot of people were involved and uh, the users didn't users were us and users were us so um, now is this is uh, expanding the projects getting larger now commercial interests are getting involved and uh, we're getting some uh, enterprise customers and end users starting to get interested so uh, what I would just finish with is I I think one of the real benefits that we don't have a benevolent uh, dictatorship that we have uh, a merit-based activity inclusive uh, organization that it's it's always self-balancing and so initially the um, we were balanced focused Sorry. on just our own needs and as we evolve and we start including more organizations more uh, applications running on OpenStack that will constantly be rebalanced and some decisions will be bad, but um, that's just kind of the price we pay for being this kind of organization that hopefully, like Keystone, parts of Keystone being broken, we will fix them because it will brought, be brought up and people right. effectively go off after that problem. So it, Right, it, there's <laughs> overhead to our process that we've chosen, but the right. best ideas should emerge over time. Yeah, I've yeah. been on a couple of it, sessions uh, about OAuth. Oh, it, 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 it feels to me like the, um, the, the shift from, we're building for ourselves as providers, as, as infrastructure folks, to uh, the users is not happening as fast as the actual shift of attendance at these things to actual end users, right? And so that's something we as a community should pay attention to. So I know this is the moment that you've been dreading since you, you got That's on stage. Right. Um, so in specifics, you know, I've been doing what I can to address this problem. Like my original approach was everyone should do what I say, which obviously doesn't scale. Then it was the creation of the user committee during the drafting process, which I think has been not as successful as we would have liked, but certainly has been very important. Very important. Now it's ref stack. Okay. But uh, just from each of you, if you have maybe the one thing that you think we as a community should be doing to constrain sprawl in our, in our options, you know, the, the thousand option problems where 90% of them don't really work, uh, what, is the, what is the one thing we should focus on? Uh, the one thing I'd like to see is a, a formal acknowledgement of the fact that there should be sort of flavors of OpenStack, not, not snowflakes and that we should use RevStack and or Tempest and in the CI system be testing you know, the AWS configuration options for OpenStack because right now, you know, according to my team, and I did not check this myself, but there's a bunch of AWS compliance tests that we don't actually run in the CI system because the default OpenStack options actually don't you know, cause those to fail. So I'd like to see us you know, testing these flavors in the CI system and sort of tracking from release to release that we're making sure that we are, you know, have a flavor of OpenStack that's conformant with all the flavors we think make sense. And we should allow anybody to come up with ideas for making flavors. It should be a really easy process, just like it is to add code so that we can, you know, get a whole bunch in there and then what people choose to use will rise to the top and we'll all follow that. So we have set up RefStack to run all the Tempest tests, including the sort of not on by default ones. There. So we can, we can look at it and say, oh, well, the reason we don't run those tests is because nobody's cloud actually supports them. But right. we can go through that. Yeah, and thank you for that work, Josh. Yeah. The, the one thing that, that I would look to do is to better, uh, maybe more crisply define the operator, user, end user type of roles. And, and right, and 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 make sure that those roles are adequately represented in the technical committees and, and other groups, whether they're elected or, or appointed or um, self-identified. That the ratios, maybe it, maybe it's every six months when when we come to these things that we we survey and we look and we say, okay, how many people fit into these groups? Let's make sure that the representation we have on the groups making the decisions reflect that. And I think to, to Sean's point a, a second ago, right, that, that's kind of switching over time. And I think the, the balance is, is going to be, if we look a year from now, it'll be much heavier on the end user side. And we should make sure that the efforts we're doing, like Josh or, or anyone else, represent the people that are consuming what we're building. Well, let's take one last question. So is it possible to have experimental or lab section in OpenStack so that, you know, uh, for my requirement, maybe it's a special requirement for telecom, maybe like, you know, the, all the instances should be extremely, you know, in the same host. Uh, currently, maybe the scheduler is not doing it. It's maybe it's supporting for other and other 
cloud providers, but for telecom, this is a requirement, uh, could be. So if we turn on this uh, flag or, you know, a feature, experimental feature, uh, it helps people to reduce the snowflakes and try it out and then, you know, yeah, that's a give, good give it back to the community. Right, there should be a, a flavor or a couple of flavors for, for carriers because they have very special requirements, so. Yeah. Okay. Basically, opinions. Publish and maintain opinions for OpenStack, so. That, um, so, I have one last question for the panel, but I, I'm really afraid to throw it at the end. So, any other question? <laughs> so this isn't really a question as much as it is a little bit of an opinion, but um, talking about the snowflakes versus the flavors, I think having things as pluggable and modular as possible is how you speed innovation and allow people to research in a specific niche of the stack, yeah. and that's highly useful. Yeah. Um, going to flavors, though, I think the issue of how hard it is to stand up a new uh, OpenStack instance and get it useful for end users. Um, perhaps reference implementations might be a better way to think of flavors and come up with a standardized set of reference implementations that go through test and have documentation of here's how you stand up this reference implementation and meet this set of uh, requirements. And you know, that might be the area that an architecture board or something might be useful for to take, hey, is this new module or is this new feature ready to be put into a reference implementation? Yeah, that's really the intention. It's to get the flavors defined and then to use that to, to actually build, you know, heat templates or some other kind of description that Triple O or something like that can then use to stand up specific deployments. But I, I just want to point out real quick, and I, I know this is going to be real hard for people to swallow, but you know, one of the epiphanies I had on Tuesday about the mission, the original OpenStack mission, is that at the very end it says the objective is to be simply installable and massively scalable. Those are two very opposing approaches, right? You know, I've built my system to be massively scalable, and it's freaking hard to make it easy to install. And if you go and you say, okay, can I get Amazon Web Services and just go install Amazon Web Services with a push button? No, you can't, because it's really massively scalable. And so those, that's part of the reason why I think we need these flavors, right? Because what somebody needs in a lab on a couple racks is really different than what somebody needs across 10 or 20 or 30 racks. Right, like when I pan the OpenStack networking, you know, it's fine across one or two racks. It's totally fine. It's absolutely acceptable for a lab environment. It's just not acceptable for production. But why isn't there like the easily installable lab environment flavor of OpenStack, right? That's like really vetted, you know, to, to plug my competitor's product, you know, uh, something like Piston has got an opinion in it so you can stand it up really quickly on five to 10 servers without a lot of trouble. And I think that's very useful for very specific use cases. All right, Josh will argue with me, and it's okay. Um, and then, you know, we're a little bit different because it, you know, I do average rack deployments of three to five racks and I need a multi network strategy and getting the network set up takes the bulk of our time because it's not just a couple switches, it's like eight to 12 switches initially. Yeah, so. we, we get the same question about our public and private cloud, like why isn't it 100% the same code base? Well, our public cloud spans many global data centers and our right. private cloud is a download that you can put and run in, in five minutes, right? right. And, and it's the same outcome for the users. It feels the same once you've installed it and used it, but the way you get there is different. And, and I, if you have conformance testing for Rackspace public cloud, you could sure. have Rackspace tools should private work cloud across both actually you know, uh, meet those conformance tests. Absolutely. I, I think one last note on the, on the flavors, you, know, that you, you kind of have different use cases for the infrastructure and the way the infrastructure is built and, and the things it's trying to achieve. And then you've got workload flavors, right? If you, if you ask the end users, they want flavors of, of cloud that help them with data sure. problems or with web scale problems Absolutely. or with other things, yeah. right? So to wrap up, I think that since we run out of time and thank you the panel, I think that uh, we're living up to the promise of being the operating system of the cloud. It looks like we really have so many different options, so many different things, and we're doing a lot of things well. Uh, correctly, so no matter what, uh, who wins, users versus developers, infrastructure, makes the choice, it looks like we are 
struggling and that's the normal way to go. So that's to be expected. Uh, thank you very much for attending and uh, <laughs>